Let me tell you something, though. When we talk to guys, we have a really, really clear vision, and I'm really pumped about the vision. Basically, our vision is about three things. We are all about trusting Jesus Christ to build an army of men who are becoming the best version of themselves in Christ and changing their world. So there are three things there. Building an army. We ask guys to enlist. We have got some free resources for you guys that you need to take advantage of. 20 of you downloaded our app last night. I checked. We have a free app. It's the best app out there. I've, des- I've asked Dale. Dale designed it. It's an app designed for a guy like me who doesn't like details. Big, bold, easy to find. You guys will love this app. It's free for you. Our podcast, like I said, we've grown by 300% a year. We're at 40,000 downloads right now. I mean, it is the best resource out there, I believe, to equip men living in the bubble. Go and download that thing. Get that on your phone. Listen to it regularly. And also, with the third thing is get on that Men Arena Facebook page. I'm telling you, we are recruiting men in the arena pastors to be on that group. We have nine pastors from five states right now ministering to men strategically on that group. It is a phenomenal resource. So guys, go get involved in that. And then invest in resources. I don't care whose resources you invest in. We've got great stuff, but there's stuff that's better. If you want to do Mark Men, if you want to do Cave Time, if you want to do the Resolute in Michigan with a, my buddy uh, Vince, I don't care what it is. Just go invest in your life. You guys are the patriarchs. You are the leaders of the church. You need to make an investment. So I don't care where you make it, but make it in you, right? A guy came up to me a couple weeks ago. Can I buy a boat? No, I don't think that'll work. You want to be business. So don't do that. So, hey, just to review. Just to review, and we're going to jump into tonight. I just lost my sermon again. There it is. We've got the tree trunk, right? Remember the tree? We've got the tree. It's on your chest. It's on your book, your uh, notebook. We've got the tree. Remember the tree? So you got this trunk going up. Let's imagine this big tree. It's going up. It's 10 feet before you see the first set of boughs, right? What has happened? That tree has been trimmed. That tree has been trimmed for two reasons. It's been trimmed because you have to trim the lower levels to get that tree to grow to its maximum height soon. And you also need to protect the ground around it from fire. So you do that to protect this tree. So this tree will grow to its maximum potential. Your relationships are limited, right? You can't have it all. There's 7 billion people on the planet. You can't have them all. That next level is the lowest, the low boughs, the low hanging fruit. These are these relationships of people that you would have, you would know. They're in the community. You see them walking by. You say, hey, what's up at the coffee shop? You know them. They know your name. Maybe they go to church with you. But you have chosen to know these people through whatever means it is. I don't know. But you have a relationship with these people. These are easy relationships. They're safe relationships. At church, I call them foyer relationships. They're safe and easy. But tonight we're going to get to the next level. This is the mid-level. You have to climb. This is the second level, the second set of branches on your shirt. You have to climb to get to this level. And as you get to this level, as you look at the tree, the tree begins to thin. It begins to narrow the closer you get to the top. The relationships at this level are less than the relationships at the lower level bow of the tree. Uh, so I want to. So we're going to go there tonight. And before we do, I want to share a picture. Two years. I, I I can't swim. I, I don't. I had a bad experience in freshman high school, and I'm just not a swimmer. But I got scuba certified two years ago, and so scuba's cool because you're already at the bottom of the ocean, so you don't have to know how to swim. So my son and I went to Washington. We got certified in 46 degree water. They were excited that day because we had 10 feet visibility. My son got hypothermia. It was New Year's Eve. 2016, it started snowing, and this is a picture of us getting certified. It was a dark day, too. Oh, sorry. So that's my, oh, by the way, my son Colton today was MVP of the college football game. Come on, hold on. Three punts, 51 yard average, all inside the 10 yard line, all spirals that turned over. Of course, my wife said that the first thing he said was, I sure wish dad could have seen that. Anyway, so I felt awesome. So this is us. Now, I put a couple other ones because my wife was so jealous, she decided she was going to get certified. So this is us in Belize when I was speaking at a YWAM base, and we went snorkeling together. I just love the picture, so that's really because she's really good looking even with a mask on. And then here, then this is my first dive. Oh, that, she took that picture. And here's my next picture. Oh, I guess that's all I gave you. Okay. Well, no, you didn't. Okay. So my first ever dive. You just didn't answer it yet. Am I? I am certified at 60 feet, and my first dive in Belize went to 92 feet, because, you know, in Belize, it's all about whatever you want to do. And, uh... That one? 
that's me before the dive. Some guys, some other missionary guys, and so that uh, so that's crystal clear water. We had 150 feet visibility, a little bit different than Puget Sound in Washington. <laughs> but I show you this to tell you two things. There are two major rules when you learn how to scuba dive that I've walked away with. The first one is, and they tell you this over and over again, when you're underwater, never stop breathing. Do that. Okay. I, I, I won't. <clears throat> Number two, always have a dive buddy. Because it's in those moments when your air goes bad where you need to share air. Or it's in those moments when you have a panic moment. Or it's in those moments where you lose your way that you need to have a diving buddy. And I thought, how cool it is to have a diving buddy. How cool is it in life as men to have a man or other men who have your back? This rule applies to me tonight. It applies to us tonight. We tend to, as men, compartmentalize our lives. We tend to put our lives between these gaps. And God is not interested in gaps. He wants to permeate and fill the gaps like we learned last night. As we climb this tree of life, we need people to climb with us. We need men to climb with us. We need men in our lives to call us in to places we would never go. To call us into those hard relationships with our wife. To call us in when somebody's sick and in the hospital we don't want to go. To call us in to the deeper parts of our soul that we don't want to deal with. To call us in to our brokenness. We need guys in our life in the tree with us to call us out of everything that hinders us from becoming our best version. These guys have to have the guts to do that. Very few men today have the guts to see something in their brother and call them out. And we do it in love because we want to call them up. We want to call them up that tree. We want to call them up to the best version of themselves. And I'm, I'm very sincerely convinced today that men are stuck in a rut because they have no one in their life besides a wife who they call as a nag because she's the only one with the courage to call you out, to call you in, and to call you up. So tonight we're going to do that. If you don't have your Bible, again, go get our app, The Great Hunt for God. It's free. Bottom right corner, there's a rectangle with a cross. That's a Bible. Open it up to Mark chapter 2, and I want to pray. Father, we just sent your spirit in here today. We just pray that you'd have your way with us. We thank you for so many blessings today, for the seven trout I caught that were 24 inches long when you add them all together, for the great mountain biking the guys had, for the awesome bull moose. I just was so excited to have Dale see his first ever moose. It was like a giant. God, for the shooting of that young guy that shot that perfect all 10 shots on the paper at 100 yards today. I thank you for that guy. I thank you for his experience, for all the things, for the naps we got to take, for the hanging out with friends. We thank you for that, God. But we realize, God, again, tonight it's all about you. And God, I've, I've prepared, man. God, I've prepared. This is my A game here. But I realize again that I acknowledge that without you in the midst, it's for naught. So God, come and bail me out. Anoint this message with your Holy Spirit. Have your way with me uh, as I try to articulate the thoughts that you've given me as I teach the Bible to these men. And God, meet us where we are tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Here's the scene. Mark chapter 2. The scene takes place in a little village of 1,500 population called Capernaum. Capernaum was Jesus' home base. Now, in this story, if you look at this, we actually see Jesus going, and he's going into his house. Now, I don't think he owns this house, but I believe he lives in this house. In fact, the Bible tells us he does. And here he is, and we see that this is, this is the story where he is preaching. There are crowds around him. People can't get around and some buddies decide they want to get their friend close to Jesus. And the friend is paralyzed. They want their buddy to hear Jesus. And so they bring their buddy to Jesus. And they're willing to do it at all costs. Now realize that the, the Jewish home during this day and age had a flat roof, okay? It had a flat roof. And the flat roof was the ancient, what you'd call an ancient man cave. It's where people went in the heat, after the heat of the day to hang out and to congregate. Luke 5 tells us, that this particular roof was not uh, dirt filled with grass like a lot of them were, but it was actually tiled. So we know it was a, a wealthier guy's house. 
It has tile on top. Uh, Deuteronomy 22, uh, chapter 22, verse 8 says there was a, a guardrail around the house to protect you from falling off. Jewish law actually had a law for about this. And <coughs> usually there was a, a stairway on the outside. <coughs> this note happens all the time. I'll be fine. Don't worry. A stairway on the outside of the house that goes to the top. Because the homes were so small, the stairway was outside. Okay? So this is the scene. that We have this scene right now. Let's focus on verses 1 and 2. And when he returned, he meaning Jesus, to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. Watch this. And he was preaching the word to them. Now, Mark is really concerned, because now realize, the, Mark, the Gospel of Mark is translated, Mark wrote it down, translated through Peter. Did you know this? Gospel of Mark is Peter's gospel. Trans translated through Mark to us, and Peter, as he's translated this, he focuses on Jesus, the human being. He focuses this gospel on the man Jesus and the friend Jesus. In Luke chapter 5, Luke's gospel focuses on this theme that Jesus is throwing a party, and even you Gentiles can come. I'm a Gentile. Any of you Gentiles? I'm a Gentile. Thank you, Luke, for Gentile. For so there's this party. So Luke really emphasizes this healing miracle of this paralytic who we don't even know is Jewish. Where Mark emphasizes that this guy, Jesus, is at his house preaching the word of God to these guys. So it's a little bit different emphasis. Same exact story. Same exact night. As I read this, it hit me. I need guys like this in my life. I need men on the roof who love the word of God more than they love me. I need men. These guys, the Bible records. Look at Mark. These guys in Mark wanted their buddy to get to Jesus because he was preaching the word of God to him. In fact, even Luke records that Jesus did not heal the man until after he had forgiven him. So there is a strong case being made that these guys did not bring their friend to Jesus, even though he was paralyzed, to be healed, but to hear the truth of the word of God from Jesus. I can make a strong case for that in Mark. So here we are. Mark never ever says they wanted their friend to be healed. He never records that. We live in a spiritually confused church and a spiritually confused society where senior pastors are taking their own lives. Where pastors of the largest churches in America are falling morally. Men, now more than ever in this spiritually confused watered down world we need the word of god more than ever my men on the roof tell me the brutal truth about god and his will and how to live in obedience to it they tell me the brutal truth about his word and obedience no matter how much it hurts me they are willing to wound me in love because they have the cojones to love me through the hard stuff in life and those things that paralyze my faith Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrates soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it uh, judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. I've got to be very careful who I let climb with me. If you want to come and hang in the lower bands, bend your knees and swing and sing and skip and do da and pretend to take risks, go for it. But as you climb the tree with me, you better have guts. Because I need guys to call me out because I am a train wreck. I'm not really a train wreck. But I've got issues like you because I'm a human being. I think I made my point loud and clear to him. Am I making my point loud and clear to you? What kind of friend are you? I wrote, I wrote something down because I sometimes forget. I tend to talk too fast and I, I kind of ramble. So I wrote this down. Do your men on the roof call you in, call you out, and call you up? If not, throw them off the roof. The tree can only hold so much dead weight. The roof only has so much room. How extreme will your men on the roof get so you can hear the life-changing truth of the Word of God? Better yet, how extreme are you, guy? Do you... I just added the guy part. Okay. Do you sit passively by as those you care about suffer through poor choices while you hold the answers in the Word of God? What kind of friend is that? An enemy. Some of you are enemies to your own children because you don't have the guts to teach them truth. 
or to your spouse or to your best friend. I've been like that before. I've been a gutless wonder to people I love because I don't want to offend them with the truth from the word of God that I base my life on. There's room in the lower boughs for men who don't love the word of God more than they love me. But not here, not on my roof, not way up in the treetops. That man has no room in my life. You can't be in that mid-level guys alone. You need to have men with you. You must have men on the roof. So here's a bigger question. Here's a bigger question. The men on my roof love the word of God more than me. But think about this. Who's really up on my roof? Who's on my roof? Let's look at verse 3. The Bible simply says this. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. How many men? Wrong. Read it again. How many men? Wrong. How many men does the Bible say? This is the Bible stuff. And they came. How many men? Okay, let me give you a hint. New American Standard, English Standard Version says, and some, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, NIV says, some men. So how many men came? We don't know how many men. How many men carried him? Four. Four. Okay, good, 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 good. Because you're going, come on, Ramos, four. Come on, give me a break, four. Four carried him. Now think about this for a second, guys. Somebody, I I just think of my role. There's no way that Jim Ramos is going to climb with a paralytic guy on the roof. I will break the ladders. I'll break the steps. But I'll tell you what I can do. I'll build, I'll block. I will block, make a hole. I grew up, that's my college. I had a full ride scholarship to make holes for guys to run through. I will make a hole, and then I will get, and I will have one of you guys, I'll have you, because you're a lieutenant colonel, you're going to stay at the stairs with me, we're going to guard the stairs. The four skinny guys are going to haul the dude up, right? The little rabbit guys, they're going to dig the hole. (laughs) And then we're going to lower that sucker down, and we have three or four more big guys, they're going to get everybody out, and they're going to guard the way as he lowers himself to Jesus. There could have been five or six or eight guys there. You know the guy's wife is there going, get out of the way! Get out of the way! <laughs> so a lot of times what happens, guys, is this. We go, oh, four guys. I wrote this down. Here's what I think the Bible is telling me. That I need men on the roof to fill gaps in every area of my life so that I do not relax and I get paralyzed. I need men on the roof. I need at least a man on the roof to be there with me at work. When I'm coaching, I need a man on the roof. As I'm coaching, I need a man on the roof in in my church. I need men on the roof in every area of my life so that I do not throttle back. Men who are willing to say, you know, that thing that you said at work did not represent Jesus well. I need men to fill every hole and every gap in my life. I listen to a lot of podcasts because because I podcast, I listen to podcasts. One of my podcasts I like is by uh, two Navy SEALs, uh, Dan Rutherford and Marcus Luttrell, the lone survivor, right? And they interviewed on their Team Never Quit podcast a young lady named Taya Kyle. Her husband, Chris Kyle, is the American sniper. And on that podcast, she got really passionate. She started calling these guys out about the divorce rates among Navy SEALs. I'm a huge fan of our military. I'm a, I mean, there's Hondale. There's no bigger fan of our military and our flag than this guy. I mean, seriously. But she said something that rocked my world to the core. She said, we have to do something about the divorce rates among Navy SEALs. Navy SEAL divorce rates are 90%. Whoa. In peacetime. In peacetime. Not war. It's almost 100% more in peacetime. And I sat back and I realized that these are the most compartmentalized human beings on the planet. They are the greatest warriors when it comes to defending our freedom and the biggest wimps when it comes to loving a woman. And I thought, how can the great hunt for God help our Navy SEALs? Because we have created compart- they have created a compartment where there's nobody on their roof watching their back when it comes to, oh, they're experts when it comes to defending our freedom. But they're almost worthless 
when it comes to defending their right. Do you see the gap, guys? Do you see the no man on the roof here, men on the roof here? We need men on the roof in every aspect. Police, you need guys on the roof at the police force. You need guys on the roof where you work. You need guys to work where you're at. We need guys on the roof. You the guys in high school. You need to have some buddies that you are accountable to, right? You guys in high school, this high school's a nightmare to be a follower of Jesus. You need to go, hey bro, let's lock arms, man. I got your back, buddy. I got your back. You two brothers, you get Morgan boys, you guys say, hey bro, I got your back, man. I got your back. I mean, your back's about the same size anyway. Just I got your back, right? You guys need to say that to each other because you're going into the you're going into the public schools or wherever you're going, and you need to watch each other's back. I'll be on the roof for you, bro. I'm up in the tree with you, man. I'm in the tree stand with you. I need guys like that in my life. You need guys like that in your life. Men, is there a role in your life where you are paralyzed and do not re represent Jesus well? Like the paralyzed guy in our story. Is there a role in your life where you are spiritually paralyzed? I want you to ask that right now. Your marriage? Your witness at church? Your witness at work? Is there an area of your life right now where you are rendered spiritually paralyzed? Guys, we have to address that. Because the Bible's addressing it tonight. So when a man, when a man in my life is given the great title of man on the roof, there is an expectation, right? If he's going to be on my roof, if he's going to be on your roof, there's an expectation, right? Well, what is it? What is it? Look at this. Look at verse uh, 4. And when they could not get near him, Jesus, because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. Now, this is Jesus' house. He lives here. Right? Can I make a case that he lives here based on verse 1? I believe he lives here. Every scholar you ever talk to will agree that this is his home base, Capernaum. I believe this is the house he's living in. He's going home to chill out. He starts preaching the word. He's Jesus, you know. They removed the roof above him, and when they had made an opening, they let down the bed, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Men on the roof break through all barriers from <coughs> preventing me from seeing Jesus. They call me into areas I would not normally venture. They call me out of everything bringing bondage to me where Christ wants to have freedom. They call me up to the best version of me. They never let me... Oh, these guys are annoying. Gary McCusker's one of these guys. They never let me off the hook because they love me as Christ loves me. They are more concerned about my freedom in Christ than being nice, polite, or politically correct. Because they realize there's only so much room in that tree. There's only so much room on that roof. And they have the wonderful honor and privilege to be one of my men on the roof. And one of your men on the roof. At some point, guys, listen. At some point, we all get paralyzed and need a breakthrough. All of us. We all do. Whether it's an unhealthy relationship, bondage to sin... Unforgive us of someone who hurt us or past fears of entering the fray and the arena of manhood. The Bible says in Galatians 5, it is for fright, or in, uh, it, I don't know what, it says in, it was for freedom that Christ set us free, therefore keep standing firm and do not be subject to the yoke of slavery. For you are called to freedom, brothers, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. I just love this. I love it that they're doing this to Jesus' home. Maybe his bedroom. But see, the men on the roof don't care about the house. They care about their buddy. They knew their buddy needed to see and hear from Jesus ASAP. And they were going to break through all obstacles, no matter what. No whatever anybody thought. Nothing. Nothing. What is paralyzing you today? What is paralyzing me today? Do I need to break through? Do you? If you're in bondage, you need a breakthrough. And you need to lock arms with Jesus. You need to lock arms with men in the arena. Some of you are here tonight, you're stuck in a rut. You're paralyzed as the less, version, the less than version of yourself because you hate your job. Because you aren't taking care of your body. Because you're doing and saying things you shouldn't. You're, just, you're, you're in a less than state of life. And, and I'm not talking about things we can't control. This is something we can't. Like, if you're 80, you're going to have a different body than a guy who's 100, right? There are certain things we can't really control. The things that we can control. 
Some of you are frozen in time because you're paralyzed by past unforgiveness. I was at McCusker's doing a remodel, and he goes, hey, look at this sink, and it's a Moen sink. And that's the last name of the pastor who I worked for had a massive falling out. And I go, oh, I don't buy Moen products. I only buy Delta because I don't want to be reminded of the pain, right? That's a true story. That happened two days ago. Past pain. Corey Tunboon said, to forgive is to set a person free only to discover that person is you. When you're in bondage to unforgiveness, you're the one who's enslaved, not them. They may not even know. We have to forgive. Maybe some of you are caged by fear. In other words, you're paralyzed by the what ifs. What if I get laid off? What if I confront that my boss? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? Some of you are in bondage to sin. You're paralyzed by it. You've got to address, we've got to address our sin, guys. I'm a big guy. You big guys, you've got to adjust your food. You've got to address it. Being fat is gluttony, and gluttony is a sin. I don't care that my mom called me husky. Still fat. Still calls me husky. I'm still fat. We've got to address our weight, guys. We've got to address our alcohol consumption. We've got to address pornography. We've got to address how we sometimes will say harsh things and frame our wife in a negative portrait to those we love and are raising. We've got to address our bondage. Anything that sets us, slows us down in our race, anything that hinders us from climbing up the tree, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that has been set before us. So what happens next in this story? Ruin my theology. In fact, we have a Facebook page, this Men in the Arena, and we have sometimes, we got guys that are super Pentecostals that are coming in, then we got these like, you know, Presbyterian Frozen Chosen's coming in, you know, or whatever, you know, or we got our fundamental Christians, we have these big wide range of people, we're trying to navigate around it, right? So we had this deal on healing, and this one guy comes in, oh, if you just believe, if you just believe, it's all about faith, and I'm like, dude, that's not true. That is not true, because this next verse ruined my theology. Look at it. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. You see, Jesus saw beyond the debris in his face to the faith of a few men on the roof. Here's what I want to share with you guys tonight. The men on the roof changed me by their faith. Some of you are here and you're going, my wife has changed me by her faith. My men on the roof changed me by their faith. They call me in, they call me out. And they call me up. And by the grace of God, I become something better. I become engulfed in God's favor because of their faith. Isn't that interesting? Now think about this. Never in this passage does it say that Jesus saw his face. Faith. Do you realize the paralytic in this story is anonymous? He's unnamed. He never speaks. He's anonymous in his own story. Or is it his story? Whose story is this? Think about this for a second. This unknown, unnamed, unspoken man is healed because of the faith of some men on the roof. Men on the roof change you. They change you. Give a shout out to this uh, Mark Ben for Christ thing. Talking to Doug and... and, uh, Whatever your name is, Bob, the big lure man today. And these guys are so fired up about this thing. They got the necklace and the thing. And I'm like, they're like, yeah, bro, bro, yeah, I love this thing. And I'm like, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. It's saying, I'm going to have a bond with somebody. How oh, that hurt. I'm going to have a bond with somebody. I'm going to lock arms with somebody. I'm going to get on the roof. I'm going to have your back, bro. And I'm going to mean it. I'm just going to say it. I'm not just going to hit the little thumb button on Facebook. I'm going to actually be in your corner. And because of my faith, you're going to be better. And I hope that every man I interact with on a mid-tree, rooftop level is changed because of my faith. I have doubted the great hunt for God. When I launched the great hunt for God, I truly, with all my heart, believe God wanted to teach me a lesson in failure and humility. That's a confession. (laughs) But I have guys in my life like Dale Culver who believe in what God is doing through this ministry more than I believe in it. And at times when I've said, I'm going to go to the real job. I can make way more money. I don't have to kiss up anybody's butts anymore. I can just go do my own thing and hide in the lower branches and nobody will love me. Guys like him have said, oh, nobody, every man in the country is going to hear of us. 
we're going to do this thing. And I'm going to talk you through it. And I stand to you today strong because of heroes like Gary McCusker and Dale Gore. Amen. Me, personally. Personal story. Because their faith has changed me. I can stand here today with, as a confident man because I have a wife who believes in me to the death. She's on the roof with me. She actually told me what to, kind of tiles to put on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to paint it all the time. It's a whole other story for tomorrow morning. <laughs> but I thank God for the men on the roof. I thank God for guys with guts to love me enough to call me out. Because I'm a stubborn guy. I can appear to be unapproachable. I know this. Some of you are like that too because I've talked to you. You need strong men. You need a strong woman, a strong wife. Young guys, young guys, under 25 guys, this is what I call the association principle. It says this, birds of a feather flock together. Like begets like. Water seeks its own level. You are the sum total of the five guys you hang out with most. Hey, if your friends are a jackass, better put a bridle on. Because you're one too. You're never going to be as good as your closest buddies, your men on the roof. So if you don't like how you are, find some new friends. And I know that sounds harsh, guys. Don't get rid of them, just push them down the tree a little bit. Because you're climbing, you need people that are going to climb so you can become the best version of you in Christ. And you need men to help you get there because it's hard to do it on your own. Does anybody know what this is? Does anybody know what this is? So for Christmas, I bought my wife an appliance. And I normally don't do that because it's like saying to her, I hate you. But this year she said, I want this appliance. So I bought her a Nespresso machine. So the, they come in these little cups. They look like Keurig cups. And they're glorified espresso shots. I mean, they're kind of pretty. Look at these things. Look at how co they're pretty colors. They're pretty, right? Pretty. But the, the problem with these is when you get them, you put them in this bag and you send them back to the espresso because these are worthless. You can't do an espresso two times through. If you run an espresso or if you run a Keurig cup two times through, it's what I call weak sauce. We don't need second time Keurig guys in our life. When we climb to the branches, guys, we need guys that are potent, that are powerful, that are bold, that are courageous, that love Jesus, that love the word of God more than they love us, that love freedom of Christ more than they love our bondage. We don't need guys that need to go get recycled to climb with us. Those are the guys we put at the bottom, right? We love them. We love them. We, we love them. We, they're friends. But those guys that climb the roof, those guys are different. They're not second time. They're not Keurig, second sauce Keurig guys. They're not weak. We need strong guys. And I know, guys, that tonight, some of you are saying, that's a harsh word. It is. Because God has called you to do something great. And it was quoted this week by Brad, Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live, but Jesus Christ now lives in me. This life I live in the flesh. I live for the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And if you're going to live a life of death, you need to go up the tree with guys who have died already as well. And they're dying every day for Jesus with you. And they're keeping you up in that tree that only has so much room for your fat butt and mine. <laughs> Father, thanks for this time. As I look back to 25 years of youth ministry, I think the number one thing that caused great Christian kids with great Christian parents to fall away from Christ was friends who were not great Christians. And so, God, I pray for us as men to not isolate ourselves as islands, to not think we can do it alone, but, God, to find other men in every facet and every compartment of our life to lock arms with us. I pray for these young guys here today, many here with their dads. These dads just want them to follow their godly example. And, God, I pray in doing so that these young men, 25 and under, would lock arms with other sold-out followers of Jesus that they can climb the mountain of life, the tree of life, and rest on top of the summit, the rooftop, as they serve Jesus together. Amen. Thanks, guys.